Hello everyone, in this video we will continue working on the Boron 2 and we will start by doing some Enraged Rabbit project adjacent uh, things. First of all, finishing the top electronics chamber skirts for the Doom Cube mod, which I've started ages ago. But uh, after that, also adding an extrusion based frame on top of the printer for the spool holder slash filament buffers, the Enraged Rabbit project carrot patches for the Enraged Rabbit project carrot feeder, and a bunch of cosmetic touches as well. And then I plan to do the Enraged Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder in this video as well, but instead I will be doing a bunch of mods on the gantry, so that's the second part of the video. I will switch the plastic parts on the gantry with aluminium parts, I will be switching the belts with 9mm belts instead of 6mm, and I will also be doing an all-wheel drive mod, meaning two motors per axis. So uh, yeah, I think this will be a pretty busy video, so let's begin. But before that, thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. PCBWay offers cheap, fast and high quality PCB prototyping services. As someone who used their PCB services in the past for multiple projects on this channel, I can recommend them to anyone who's looking for a PCB manufacturer for their next project. They also offer other types of prototyping services like 3D printing, including MJF, SLA, other types of 3D printing services, and other prototyping services like CNC machining, injection molding, and laser cutting. For more information about their PCB and other prototyping services, click the link in the description below. As you can see, first of all, there is no place for the for me to mount the Enrage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder on here. So with the original plan for my uh, Voron 2 Doom Cube, the idea was to have the Nevermore here, the electronics on top of the Nevermore, and this area was for the uh, carrot feeder, and I didn't really have plans on the printer for the carrot patches, the filament holders, because I had those wall mounted, but I'm not doing that this time. And as you can see, the original spot for the Enraged Rabbit Project carrot feeder is now occupied by the electronics, and the Nevermore is much taller than that, so just than the original Nevermore, so just doesn't make sense to put these over the Nevermore, so yeah, that's not happening, so instead we will be adding another, kind of like those illegal floors some people add on their buildings, we'll add another layer, another chamber on this printer, and that will be extrusion based, and yeah, we'll put all that on that, but uh, before that we need to uh, finish, first of all design and then print the skirts for the top electronics chamber. There is one more thing I want to do, and that, I think this one I will do first, and that is uh, printing something to keep these side panels in place so i showed this in the previous video but some side panels like this one have a tendency of just popping out and i'm trying to keep that in place with duct tape but a that's ugly and b as you can see it's not even working so there is actually a panel holder thing i designed way back on uh, when i did this mod that i just need to print so we will start with that and then i will also show you the plan for the top electronics chamber skirts and the extrusions i haven't really designed all that yet but uh, I have a rough idea in mind, so yeah, uh, again, I will keep the current plan, uh, current layout, nevermore, electronics, and Rage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder will sit on top of here on some extrusions, and then the uh, carrot patches will be on yet another layer on top, and yeah, I have a 9 channel and Rage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder, so I need 9 filament holders, so that will take a decent amount of space, but I think it should fit uh, I don't know, I guess we will see, so anyway, uh, that's the plan, uh, I'll, st I'll start working on those, I'll print the panel holders off camera and I'll come back to you with the CAD files, but uh, first I have to deal with this uh, tension seeker, of course he's on top of the kitchen cabinets, anyway, uh, be right back. Here is the plan for the mod, so uh, imagine the Boron 2.4 Doom Cube is under here, so this is the top electronics chamber. And here are the skirts I designed for the top electronics chamber. I think they look pretty nice. One thing that's not modeled in here is the uh, flanges on this side of the skirts. So yeah, there is an orange accent piece here and here. And the total height of the skirts is about 160 millimeters. So these are pretty tall top skirts, but uh, I think they will look pretty nice. So. Yeah, that's the idea. The reason why these are this tall is because of the Nevermore Max air filter here. And the problem with that is, as you can see, the top panel of this, which I need to open from time to time to replace the active carbon inside the Nevermore Max tube, is the, yeah, the hinge here. So I need the top acrylic panel to be able to open. And I don't have the um, joints modeled in Fusion 360, so I can't show this in action, but yeah, I just needed to uh, be able to fit my hand through here and also need to have enough room for this to swing open. And 
yeah, the only way to do that was to make these top skirts pretty tall. But uh, yeah, I think it will look pretty nice. And as for how this top uh, extrusion frame is held in place, if you look here, these top accent pieces go over the extrusion. So basically, there's a screw in here that goes into the skirt and then another screw that goes into the extrusion. And that way it will hold the extrusion based frame in place. And that should be pretty strong enough with enough infill. But uh, just in case, I've also designed these uh, holder things to support the frame on top of the, you know, these skirt pieces, which again, I think should be enough. And uh, yeah, it fits in here like this. There's a triangular, there we go, you can see the shape. Uh, yeah, there we go. You can see how these skirts are shaped. So this fits in there and yeah, uh, that should support the extrusion frame. Now this extrusion frame, I have the model here based on the Misumi style blind joints. I will just use corner cubes though, because I have a bunch of those lying around, so I might as well use those. And yeah, you can see I have nine in total uh, filament holders, size pool holder slash filament buffers, and Rage Rabbit Project carrot patches. And uh, yeah, it's six on top and three on the bottom. And this is a mod by Draken Katze. And uh, yeah, it just means you can hang the, uh, flip the carrot patch upside down and hang the spool in place. It's not modeled here, so you can't see it here, but it is on GitHub on the user mods directory. So you can find the mod there and I will be printing that instead of, you know, obviously just, I'm not going to just flip it upside down, obviously it's just a model here. Anyway, the Raspberry Pi touch display will go on here and the Raspberry Pi will be mounted behind that. And yeah, this piece is based on the older uh, design I did for the Doom Cube. And in here, I will just double sided tape this in place on these uh, things I designed on the front skirts. And then, yeah, as I said, the Raspberry Pi is be uh, mounted behind the display. And as I said, the uh, spider is uh, sits in here for controlling the printer. And the Enrage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder sits on this extrusion here. This is based on the original Enrage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder V1. I will uh, print a later version of this, but that will be in the next video. But uh, anyway, it will sit on extrusions here. And here is the top aluminum frame I ordered from Misumi. It's all assembled here. I wanted to be a bit cheap with this, so I didn't order uh, the tapping or a blind hold drilling services. So I tap these manually myself and I use these corner cubes, which I don't recommend for 3D printer builds or anything that has to be really square, but this is just a glorified shelf, so it doesn't really matter. So yeah, I used uh, these uh, corner cubes that I already had and uh, they'll work just fine. And the these uh, inner extrusions, I just use these corner brackets. And again, they're not great, but again, this is just a glorified shelf, so it'll be fine. And uh, this cutout is, uh, th this is missing one extrusion so that the uh, hinge of the Nevermore Max can open. And Razor Bit Project Carrot Feeder will go here. And the carrot patches will go on these extrusions. So, uh, yeah, these two uh, and these two. And there will be three that are upside down as I showed you on the CAD. So, yeah, it is uh, ready. It took me a couple of weeks to get all this done, but as you can see, uh, the, all the cosmetic parts and the aluminum extrusion on the top is now all in place. I didn't really film any of this because uh, honestly, just uh, screwing in cosmetic parts isn't that exciting, but I just want to show you the result. So the side panels, as I said, I use these panel holders. These serve two purposes. One, they help seal the panels from air gaps from, you know, so that the air doesn't escape the chamber. And two, they prevent from panels from popping out, which I have talked about before. And then there is these top uh, electronics chamber uh, skirts, and I'm pretty happy with how these turned out. And then the aluminum extrusion on top. So here I've assembled uh, nine of these Enrage Rabbit Project carrot patches, the spool holder slash filament buffers, and these are ready to be installed on the printer now that the extrusion is on top of the printer. I know there's eight here, I'll show you the one which is already on the printer. So uh, yeah, the three of these ones in the front, these are the upside down Air uh, Rabbit Project Carrot Patch mod by Drachenkatze, something like that, my German sucks anyway. Uh, though technically I know a little bit, but anyway, uh, pronunciation sucks. Anyway, uh, the five here and the one on the printer, they're the regular kind with the extended spool arm. Even though I'm actually just using standard one kilogram spools, I just figured having that compatibility would be nice. So that's what I printed. 
and um, yeah the way these work is pretty simple so uh, normally this is as I said up, uh, upside down so the uh, just like a Voron spool holder the PTFE tubes on the top uh, the spool sits on here and you know it rotates smoothly goes through this here and then that exits round here I don't know how much of that you can see but the Bowden tube is in a plastic slot here I'm not talking about the Bowden coupling I'm talking about the tube here and then uh, you spool it around the wheel a few times and then insert the Bowden tube here that runs to the Enrich Rabbit Project carrot feeder so the main MMU unit so the way it works is uh, you know you spool it tight and then uh, when the Enrich Rabbit Project carrot feeder retracts filament it just spools around in this uh, area and then as you pull it the wheel rotates and yeah it just gets pulled tight and once it's actually around the wheel now then it starts pulling from the spool probably didn't do a great job explaining that but yeah you can probably find more information about this project online if you uh, want to know more about it but yeah as i said it's uh, ready and as you can see i mounted one here i'll do the rest uh, off camera Currently I'm just running it to the extruder directly, as you can see there is no Enrage Rabbit Project carrot feeder mounted. So the old Enrage Rabbit Project carrot feeder is, as you can see, fully disassembled, along with a few new parts in here that I've ended up reprinting because I switched to a different model. But here is the newer Enrage Rabbit Project carrot feeder assembled. This has a bunch of mods uh, over the stock V1, like the extrusion brace on the bottom side, the different uh, filament feeder blocks, whatever they're called. There is the spring thing in here for uh, the selector card and in here I have the Binky filament encoder which I also sell on my store now and uh, yeah, a bunch of mods like that and yeah this was going to go on the printer but uh, you know, I just, honestly I didn't have time to do much lately and as a result uh, some time passed and but I guess it worked for the better in this case because now there is an Enrage Rabbit Project uh, Carrot Feeder V2 so I'm going to be switching to that so this will be completely reprinted and disassembled and reassembled again and um, after that that will go on the printer but with that, there are also other changes as well. So, uh, for example, these Enrage Rabbit Project uh, carrot patches. Um, these have the filament buffer built in. With the V2, there is an option to have the filament buffer on the Enrage Rabbit Project carrot feeder, the main MMU unit. And I'd much rather have that instead of having the buffers on these uh, spool holders. Especially because, as you can see, this is, yeah, I don't, this is not really a <laughs> wide uh, gap for me to walk through. And I end up breaking a lot of these as my arm hits these when I'm walking and out of there, which is where I do my packing and shipping for the most part. So yeah, I have to go in there pretty often. Um, yeah, these are pretty brittle. I think it's just going to work better to have that on the MMU unit, which will uh, sit here. So that also means that even though I printed all of these, I will be reprinting all of them. So yeah, uh, that's to come later. But uh, there are also other things I should cover it since as i said it's been a while since the last recording in this video so one of the changes here is kenny's head fell off so if you've seen what this used to look like i guess kenny is now completely dead anyway uh another thing and i guess this is probably the one of the more interesting ones is water heater hot hand now known as the tube and uh, yeah i've been uh, using a beta version of that for some time now uh, it's working pretty well. The flow rate with that is pretty nice. I was using uh, Dragon High Flow before I switched to that and yeah that was limiting my print speeds by quite a bit since you know I do use this machine for business. I have to print a lot of parts and you know high flow rate really helps with that but um, yeah the Dragon High Flow wasn't keeping up with that so the tube has been working pretty well. I was using a uh, real uh, CHD nozzle with that with the water heater here I've been using a Chinese CHD I don't know I don't think you'll be able to see that with the with my terrible camera work but anyways the uh, the Chinese CHD Stefan covered on his channel and uh, that's been working pretty well as well and I'm using the Galileo 2 extruder here and I've been pretty happy with that as well I was using Galileo 1 before switching to well I was using Galileo 1 for a very long time and then temporarily switch to the clockwork 2 and then and I did had to do that because of the big 3 tech EBB SP2240 which is the uh, CAN tool headboard in here 
and you couldn't mount that with the Galileo one, at least not well. I actually did mount uh, the hard keyboard before that with the Galileo. It just wasn't doable with the uh, Big 3 Tech EPB SP2240, but it is doable with the Galileo 2 extruder because the Galileo 2 extruder is designed for tool head boards on the style burner and I've been pretty happy with that. Definitely better performance from the Galileo 2 extruder than the Galileo 1 which was already pretty good so yeah uh, I'm happy with that too. And I used that for some time with the Dragon High Flow but then I realized the bottleneck for my speed was now the Dragon High Flow so I switched to the tube hot end and yeah pre been pretty happy with that. Uh, the There were some problems with the beta of this. There were some manufacturing issues some tolerance sort of stuff but they've fixed those for the release version and it's now released so if you are interested in the tube hot end i'll i guess link it in the description below i'm using the air version in here not the conduction version because well there really isn't anything to conduct into i've been using this setup with the galileo 2 extruder the tube hot end for uh many months into fall and early winter and i was pretty happy with that but uh at the start of early winter I started having some uh, probe issues like it wasn't probing as accurately as it should and yeah I realized it was just the war on tap getting old and I had to reprint that and uh, decided to do something that's a bit more permanent than that because that happened in the past as well so I wanted something CNC'd and I had a choice between the Vitali tap and the Chaotic Lab tap and uh, I've heard much better things about the Vitali tap so that's what I used in here and uh, it's been working pretty well until very recently like the past few weeks and yeah then i started having some bad uh, top infill and bad probing issues and i just noticed what the problem is when recording this video because this magnet when i was doing this it came loose it was still seated when i uh, before i started the recording this is the second time i'm recording this so it, it came loose on the first time i recorded this so anyway um yeah, that explains it. I guess I'll talk more about the Vitalia tab when I actually disassemble the gantry, but yeah, those uh, magnet holder designs aren't great. Like, uh, Voron's magnet holders are better designed than the Vitalia tab magnet holders. And yeah, I've been having some bad adhesion problems, so I've experimented with Frank's Goo a bit as well, so that's what's in here. It smells like IPA, so maybe you should get that checked out, but anyway, Frank's Goo was uh, helpful as well with bad adhesion, but yeah, it turns out the problem is with the tap, as I said. Well, generally speaking, I don't really have any problems with bed adhesion ever since I switched to this 1mm PEI sheet. In fact, when I'm printing ABS uh, on most of my printers, including this printer before I switched to this 1mm PEI, my bed temperature was always around 100 degrees. With this 1mm thick PEI, anything over 85 degrees Celsius, it just adheres too much. So, yeah, this 1mm PEI... Uh, it adheres uh, quite a bit so I have to keep the bed temperature low but with the bed temperature low I never had any adhesion related problems but anyway I've been also having some uh, resonance issues like resonance mark on the prints obviously I have a Kuspa mounted here but you know this gantry with these printed parts has been in this printer for about two years now and it's been printing for a lot of that time and yeah, uh, I think it's just time to rebuild this gantry. So that's part of what we will do in this video and hopefully we'll also improve the print speeds as well because after switching to the water heater hot end and Galileo 2 extruder, the bottleneck has been the gantry. So so uh, yeah, I want to rebuild the gantry and do a bunch of mods at the same time. Uh, switch to most of the parts, as many of the parts as I can to aluminium parts, which shouldn't wear down as quickly as the plastic parts. So uh, yeah, I've ordered a bunch of aluminium parts. I also got these uh, long shafted motors and uh, the idea is I can use these with 9mm belts. Uh, I guess we will see how that works. Uh, and I got four of these instead of two. The idea is to switch to an all wheel drive mode as well. So have one motor here and here as well, replace the idler switch. is a win-win because as much as I like most of the Voron design parts, these idlers are really a pain in the ass throughout the belt through so yeah replacing those is also a bonus as well so yeah one motor will sit here one motor will sit here so it will be two per axis x and y or technically a and b one downside of that is i will lose some print area around here and here but 
this is a 350 millimeter bed so it's already huge like if i lose some print area it's not really the end of the world so yeah uh, that's the idea so to do that obviously i have to disassemble the printer get the gantry out of there and uh, yeah that's what's going to be in the rest of this video and the mwedge rabbit project carrot feeder which will sit here uh, we will reprint as i said with the newer parts and we'll go here and the filament holders I will also reprint and yeah they will be mounted once they're printed so those will be in the next video. So here are the parts I got for the gantry upgrades starting from the back starting with these parts these are the all-wheel drive uh, mod parts by uh, the tiny shell script so uh, as you can see this is very similar to the standard AMB drive so these two sit in the back one difference with these is as you can see the motor holder thing which is uh, this thing only if you finish printing it uh, that sits in here and that's the tensioning mechanism and then uh, there is a plate in here that uh, a screw goes into and then you know you tension using this hole and then not on this side anyway I'll get to that so uh, yeah those are the AMB drives and these replace the front uh, idler slash tensioners with just motors so uh, yeah that's how this works but uh, if you if you've noticed this part this is not stock with that tiny shell script part this is a double t pin these guys that i bought from fabrico i'll link a bunch of these in the description below by the way uh th this is the pin mode by double t and this is the nine millimeter variant instead of the six millimeter variant so yes i'm also doing a nine millimeter belt upgrade but uh, that also meant that I couldn't use the standard tiny shell script all-wheel drive mod. I had to use a mod of a mod. Yeah, the thing is, you uh, because the two plates are now spaced further apart, you need a different tensioner plate, this guy. So the stock part, I also ordered those as well as a backup. Uh, the new one is 6mm taller because, you know, 3mm taller belt times 2. Only problem with that is though, uh, if you actually look into the uh, parts you can get for 9mm belts, the idlers, pulleys and uh, bearing stacks you'll notice that they're actually made for 10mm belts not 9mm belts and that also includes the double T's 9mm which is actually 10mm as I said pin mod so that means you need to design these parts for uh, belts that are 10mm wide instead of 9mm wide so you need to add 8mm instead of 6mm and what I'm, uh, the reason I'm talking about all that is as you can see uh, these plates don't actually fit well. Now I will still try to use these because you know, it still holds on to both sides of the uh, these plates so it should still be usable but uh, yeah these should have been two millimeters wider because as I said nine millimeter hardware actually doesn't exist like that's not a thing so yeah that is one thing and if you're wondering why I didn't order these from uh, West 3D in, in uh, anodized black which is how they sell them it's because of this part uh, it, this is a mod of a mod it's not the standard mod so obviously this part isn't included in the West 3D kit and I figured might as well make all the parts match so I ordered these from Set Godsend and yeah uh, they will work uh, just uh, not ideal and I ordered these as a backup because of that difference so these are actually the correct height and yeah, they will fit uh, they will fit in here the thing with these is obviously these aren't aluminium like these plates this is mjf printed nylon so yeah that's why this is wider if you're wondering the aluminium parts i ordered these in three ish millimeters whatever the freedom three millimeters is i ordered these in that thickness but this mjf nylon part i ordered thicker five millimeters thicker just in case you know this is plastic but you know mjf printed parts tend to be pretty durable but I'll get to the rest of these MGF parts in a sec. But uh, there are also these parts. So uh, I ordered these parts from Sand Cut Sand. I started ordering parts for the rest of the printer, including this, which I'll also get to. And then I remembered, oh shit, I also need to replace the gantry XY joint parts. And I uh, figured might as well make those metal as well. And while I was browsing AliExpress for bearings, I stumbled upon this and decided to order this. So this is from Fansor on AliExpress, also linked in the description below. And this, if I read their description correctly and if I'm remembering correctly as well, so two big ifs. Uh, this is based on a, a CNC gantry mod by Double uh, Team, the guy who uh, designed these pins as well. And uh, yeah, this is a 9mm variant of that, the original one is for 6mm. 
and uh, yeah i just decided to order these these were pretty expensive i think 50 bucks for the set for you know the both sides of the xy joint but you know i wanted something metal might as well do that since i'm making the rest of the gantry metal as well so i ordered this and i actually didn't even realize that the bearings would be included but they were and uh, yeah they arrived fine except one of these this one has a small scratch on the anodization but uh, the rest of the parts are silver anyway since i had to order these from scancut sand instead of ordering the black anodized parts from uh, west 3d so yeah uh, doesn't really matter i guess and then uh, moving on we have these two pcbs so these are designed for um adding a gantry board on 15 millimeter extrusion like the micron solid fork etc and uh yeah i'll also link the guitar repository of this in the description below i found these on shami's site but he only had one of these in stock so i ordered these from fabrico and uh, this has a stm32 g0 b1 mcu on the other side behind this thermal pad and two tmc2209 drivers and yeah these are can bus as well so i'll place the, uh, one of these on each side of the gantry uh, i'll probably place this on the back extrusion instead of side extrusions side extrusions might make wiring a bit cleaner but yeah uh, if i do that then the whole spacing on, on this might not line up with the whole spacing on the uh, extrusion backers i have so i will mount this probably mount this on the back extrusion yeah, there is a thermal pad included with the order as well and i you know, placed it behind the pcb already so this is ready to be mounted just need to punch a hole through these holes and then yeah mount it on an extrusion and hopefully not short anything else that's the thing that worries me with that we'll see and uh, yeah i will be sticking with 24 volts for these i'm not upgrading to 48 volts i think 24 volts should be uh, more than good enough especially now that i'm doing an all-wheel drive mode but uh, i guess we'll see and um yeah i guess one more aluminium part the vitali tap as you can see the belt holders are a bit wider so uh yeah this is the nine millimeter variant of this uh, vitali tap mode so yeah uh, these uh i will be swapping that part with this and i also ordered the spare uh, mgm9 rail as well from west 3d while i was placing the rest of the order so um i'll check the uh rail on there and if it's bad i'll replace it with this but yeah after that we have the mgf printed nylon parts here and as you can see there are quite a bit now i actually started printing these uh, on my micron in just abs like normal but uh my micron died uh, about it was mid print i was in the room and then the printer suddenly turned off and as you can see the print didn't finish and it doesn't turn on anymore well sort of does the power supply hiccups if you don't know what that is it quickly turns on or off on or off basically a safety feature triggering on the power supply so uh yeah i need to investigate that and i really need to rebuild my micron anyway because the belts on the gantry are really worn on that uh something something bearings uh belt riding on bearing flanges so yeah that needs some love is what i'm getting at but yeah uh, because the, the sprint failed and because i already started disassembling my Voron 2.4 and because my Voron 0 is already down i didn't have a 3d printer to print these on and yeah well, i decided to order these uh, from jostack and mgf printed nylon and they did a pretty good job with these parts as far as i can tell they they're the company i usually order my mgf stuff from by the way for example if you order uh Cosma Pro from me, chances are your MGF printed parts were manufactured by Jostack. I'm usually fairly happy with their print quality. These ones, I, they had a, some of them had some, um, sometimes they tend to leave a little bit of that white MGF powder in these uh, screw holes. A few of those, uh, these parts had those. All you have to do is go in there with a long screw or a screwdriver or something and push it out. That's really not a big deal. So yeah, uh, the all the parts I need for both the uh, 9mm all-wheel drive mode and for the uh, CNC tab by Vitali since I yeah, might as well replace them in the MGF as well I ordered all of them uh, and yeah they're here now uh, one thing with these is as I said the mount by I'll put their name on the screen right now I don't really remember their name sorry uh, their mod is designed for 9mm belt hardware and as I said that doesn't really exist so uh, the problem with that is 
their mods parts are also designed for 9mm belt hardware so I, I had to load all of these parts in Fusion load them from STL, convert them to B-Rep and then modify them to work with the 10mm belt parts so yeah there was quite a bit of custom work here as well so I created a mod of a mod of a mod yeah uh, anyway these are my parts and after these are tested uh, I guess I'll publish these as well so uh, yeah you will be able to find these on a github repository or something i don't know i'll, I'll link it in the description below and uh yeah i guess that's it oh one more thing i guess uh the bearings i'm also upgrading i was using standard um you know the standard uh, steel bearings this type with the rubber seal these also have the rubber seal but as you can see they're in color and what that usually means in this case means as well is uh, these are ceramic hybrid now uh, the outer bearings I ordered from uh, West 3D and these are ABEC 9. The inner bearings uh, West 3D and Fabrico didn't have them so I ordered these from China from Reindeer directly. These are ABEC 7 instead of 9 but other than that they're also pretty much the same. They're the same uh, type ceramic hybrid which means ceramic balls uh, other than that steel uh, rest of the body. And uh, yeah they should uh, work pretty well. And um, yeah, uh, I guess uh, that's it. So, and yeah, the uh, tooth idlers and the pulleys and all that I ordered from West 3D as well. And here are the mostly assembled uh, parts. I say mostly because I didn't obviously mount these on the extrusions, so I didn't use parts like these yet. Yeah, I will obviously do that later when I uh, start installing this on the gantry. But yeah, uh, overall, this went fairly smoothly. There were a few things here and there that I needed to sort of improvise and fix and these will be uh, improved before I release these files. A mod of a mod of a mod as I said <laughs> so that'll be fun to for people to figure out but anyway uh, yeah overall as I said it went fairly smoothly. For example with these two front motor mounts I couldn't use the uh, this accent piece on this side because there is not enough clearance on the printed part. So I just need to add a notch around here, like so, just like I did here. So that's one change I need to do. And uh, these parts are obviously not part of my mod, but uh, yeah, on these ones also I couldn't use the accent part on this side for these two screws, so I didn't use it for these two either, but yeah, I mean, it's fine. For these though, for the AMB drives on the back side, I ended up uh, using them because they fit. So that's one of the... Uh, things I need to improve. Another thing is the screw length. So most of these screws are actually 40 millimeters and they barely catch the thread on the motor. They should be fine because I intend to mount the motor on the top but uh, still it, it's not ideal. And then uh, a few screws in here I think you know, on, on all four parts I think I ended up needing to use three uh, 50 millimeter screws. Obviously 50 millimeters is too long so what I mean by using 50 millimeter screws is uh, hack sawing them to about 43-44 millimeters. Yeah uh, I think I just need to make this a bit thicker and design it for 50 millimeter screws so that's one thing I'm going to change. For these parts I ended up using the MGF printed uh, tensioning. Uh, I guess this is more of a block than a plate but yeah plate normally. I just uh, figured it's probably better to use something that's the proper size instead of this barely catching on, on the aluminium. But uh, obviously the release one I'll just uh, release the uh, longer version of this and yeah should be fine. And then uh, lastly these two as I said they came with bearings installed but as you can see I uh, well first of all as you can see I swapped these uh, shiny silver ones with the gunmetal or whatever gray this is uh, pins because I think they look nicer but uh, yeah I also swapped the uh, bearings the bearings they included were these uh, fairly cheap feeling and ZZ sealed not RS sealed uh, bearings they should be fine but I decided to swap them and uh, yeah the smooth idler this is also smooth but you know, the idler that's normally smooth, I use the ceramic hybrid ones. Unfortunately here I also had to use bearings instead of the uh, toothed idlers. That was the plan, I bought a few toothed idlers to use in that spot, but yeah, the problem with that is it just doesn't line up properly. Like It definitely fits, but 
you know, the belt path will be a bit off and that might cause problems uh, like belts riding on flanges, that sort of thing. So yeah, I had to swap that to this mood and I didn't order enough because I only intended to use the ceramic hybrids for these and they are kind of expensive. So I wanted to save a few bucks, but uh, that means I had to use some of my older bearings for this. These, uh, these are still RS sealed, but standard steel bearings. These are also from Braindew. And the middle bearings in here, I used the bearings that were included with these uh, from uh, Fanzorb. They're not ideal, but they should be fine. So yeah, uh, that's one thing I had to do. So anyway, I'll do the improvements to the parts and release them later. Let's mount this on the gantry and uh, yeah, see how that goes. I removed the gantry from the War on 2. I started doing that before I got the printed parts even, but now it's completely disassembled. And uh, here are the printed parts I removed from the gantry. Sorry if I, my voice isn't great, I had a dental thing. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I was using the pins mode. I think I covered that in an earlier video as well. So those are all removed along with the bearings. And there was a lot of damage on the belts as well, as you can see from my hands. I probably should have washed that before recording this video, but anyway. Um, yeah, I started assembling the gantry as well. I didn't completely ass assemble it yet. I'll get to why that is in a sec. But the rear extrusion, as you can see, is mostly assembled. And uh, pretty happy with how it's going so far. There was one problem here, as you can see, I couldn't populate one screw hole. And that's to do with this... Uh, bearing holder printed part thing. Uh, I will modify this before releasing it. That's why I haven't released these yet because there are minor things like this that I'll need to correct. So yeah, uh, but one missing screw isn't really a big deal. It should be fine. So yeah, so far so good I think. CAN bus stepper motor driver thing is also mounted here now. So uh, yeah, uh, I mounted two of those as I talked about before and I used these uh, thermal pads and uh, as I said, apparently these things tend to overheat so uh, apparently you need that thermal pad. I'm not a big fan of this approach because while thermal pads are not conductive by design, uh, if you over tighten these screws you really can cause a short so you know, I did my best to you know, make sure the thermal pad is under all the exposed uh, pins on the bottom side of this and also did my best to not really tighten these screws but uh, you never know i guess a, a compromise might be using a thicker thermal pad that would minimize the chances of that happening but uh, this was what was included so that's what i used uh, i might end up swapping these i don't know if i i don't really have thermal pads lying around but uh, maybe I'll buy more and swap these with thicker ones. Now the problem with the thicker ones is they're not going to conduct heat as well as the thinner ones, but uh, yeah, uh, I think the cause of a, uh, the risk of a short is also a big deal. So yeah, I, I don't know. But if there is a short to the aluminium extrusion, it might not be the end of the world because aluminium extrusions like these, these are anodized and anodized aluminium extrusions are not that conductive. If I use this uh, a resistance meter thing, so this is actually used for testing uh, static uh, static shielding bags and stuff like that. I use this to test my bags that I put my electronics in when I sell them. Uh, if we if I use this, you'll see that this red light will come on. And if you look at what that red light is, uh, it's uh, pretty high resistance, which means it's not likely to cause a short. This is a crappy Chinese thing you know qual you can't uh, hear the quality but uh, it works I mean it's not a rocket science to measure resistance the reason that you need something like this is because multimeters don't go this high so they'll just say it's uh, non-conductive for uh, uh, when testing uh, anti-static bags and things like that but yeah as I said uh, with the anodization it is insulative but if you drive a pin enough into the extrusion that it goes below the anodization and obviously aluminium is uh, conductive so it is a bit of a risk that's why I'm considering swapping that with a, a thicker thermal pad and uh, yeah for uh, static bags and stuff like that you want it in this yellow range so that anyway uh, probably not really relevant for this video anyway 
I'll uh, continue working on this and uh, I'll be back when there is more to show but I think I'll need to swap these Y rails now uh, I saw how uh, dirty these were inside because I ended up removing the carriage from the rail I did put the carriage on the rail again just so I don't mess up the orientation of which carriage goes with which rail but it was uh, really messy might make sense to just uh, swap these because if some of that dirt made it into the inside channel so the channel that's not on the rail but you know, on the carriage where say if your balls are moving this way on the rail uh, they have to go back too so that channel if that if dirt made it into that uh, it might be pretty difficult to clean so I might swap these uh, I don't know we will see and either way I'll obviously end up lubricating them the MGN12 here feels just fine so I don't think I'll swap this but I will lubricate it there is a lubrication port here not sure if the camera is picking that up and there is another one on this side too so uh, I'll use that and yeah hopefully it'll be even smoother but I never really had too many problems on the X the Y though is uh, pretty bad so that's something I'll need to uh, at least I'll need to clean those but I'll probably end up swapping those rails too so a bit more progress on the gantry extrusions the side extrusions I mounted the A and B drives to but I didn't fully assemble the rest of the gantry yet and the reason for that is I decided I'm going to replace these uh, Y rails uh, I tried cleaning the rails I also lubricated these through the lubrication port one thing I didn't try is I didn't try and removing the carriages and putting it in an uh, ultrasonic cleaner but other than that I tried pretty much everything I can try and yeah these really don't feel that good uh, this is not the sort of thing you can really show on camera unfortunately but yeah these don't feel right so I, uh, I think it's just better for me to just replace those so I ordered some and I'm waiting for those but the seller shipped them with USPS so who knows when it'll get here maybe tomorrow maybe a week maybe a month it's USPS so you, you'll never know anyway <laughs> hopefully not that long we'll see uh, I think I showed these GBB 15 CAN bus PCBs mounted on this extrusion uh, I also started the wiring on these as you can see but what I mostly want to mention is I replaced the thermal pads here with and uh, new ones I bought on Amazon. These are one millimeter thicker. These are from Gallet or Gelit or however you say that. Gillet? GIF uh, is wrong, so that's not it. <laughs> Enjoy the comment section. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, these I think will work better. These are also a bit harder than the previous thermal pads. So I think it will be more difficult for the pins on the back side of the PCB to punch holes through these. Uh, if that happens, it may not be the end of the world, as I explained. If it touches the anodized top layer of the aluminium, chances are it's not going to short, but it is a risk. Also, did some work on the X beam here. So, uh, I think I said that the MGN12 rail here was fine. It wasn't. It needed a bit of cleaning, and uh, yeah, after that, I also re lubricated it as well. But the end result is now the uh, MGN12 here is very smooth. So, yeah, I think that will work pretty well now that it's cleaned. Unlike the MGN9s, I don't think anything made, in, made it into the inner channels of the MGN12 carriage. So, I think it should be fine. Though, uh, I guess we will see once I assemble the printer back again. And you can also see that I mounted the Vitali tab here with the 9mm uh, plate now. I did have some problems with these magnet holders. First of all, I had to shave a lot of plastic on the uh, part that goes into the uh, 9mm version of the uh, this plate. Um, I don't think that part, the plastic part, is designed for this. It really doesn't feel like it because I had to shave a lot of plastic to make it work. So. Yeah, that wasn't ideal. And another thing is, I really don't like these magnet holders. As I showed earlier in the video, one came loose. And yeah, another one came loose when I was assembling these. I used a liberal amount of super glue to uh, glue the magnets in place. And I also gave it sufficient time to cure, about half an hour. And the uh, first time I did uh, uh, this, a magnet came loose. So. Yeah, I really don't like those magnet holders. I might end up redesigning those at some point because 
yeah, I think that is the biggest downside of the Vitaly tab, and I think it needs fixing. So, uh, yeah, anyway, other than that, it's going pretty well. Mounted the X limit switch here as well, and it triggers on the uh, CNC, the aluminium part here, just fine. But uh, there is a problem with the Y limit switch. So, you know, the X is just fine, but the Y, assuming you're not mounting the limit switches on the port like the standard Voron 2.4, and then uh, you need to mount the Y limit switch on the uh, drive here. Uh, you know, it typically has a then you know, when this is normally a printed part, there's like a yeah. Why am I describing that? How did I have the yeah? Um, you know, it has a mount like that typically for the uh, X beam to back into, and uh, but you know how the limit switch typically works, but. Yeah, obviously this aluminium plate doesn't have that, which means I'd have to have a 3D printed part mounted somewhere around here for the same purpose. But uh, the thing is, as I said earlier in the video, my Micron is down, my Voron 0 is down, and obviously my Voron 2 is down as well, so I don't have anything to print any parts on. So uh, if I really need a 3D printed part, my only option is probably to just order MJF parts again, which takes ages, so that is not ideal. Now uh, I do have another potential solution in mind. I could just remove this X limit switch from the carriage itself and then mount the uh, port PCB. Uh, I'll put a picture of that on the screen right now. And mount that under the Y MGN9 rail and hopefully it'll trigger on the carriage and on the A drive back here or B drive, I don't know, whatever, whichever one it is anyway. Uh, I could do that. I already have a bunch of those PCBs since I sell those PCBs, so that would be relatively easy, but I'm not sure if that's going to fit in there. And uh, another problem with that is now I'll have to add a drag chain if I do that, because, you know, the wires will be uh, on the X and Y joint, and I have to carry those wires back to the where these PCBs are to uh, wire them into these canvas PCBs. So yeah, that means I'd have to add a drag chain, which is also not something I want to do. And I don't have the printed parts for those either, which means temporarily I wouldn't have a drag chain and then later I'd add the drag chain. And yeah, uh, that is also not ideal. That's something I'll have to figure out. The ideal solution is to have a printed part that's mounted somewhere around here that does that thing. So maybe I'll just uh, bite the bullet and order more MGF parts. I don't know. I'll have to figure that out. But uh, anyway, the next step for me to do is uh, wait for the new MGN 9 rails and then, you know, clean them, lubricate them, mount them here. And then I'll assemble the gantry and uh, yeah, I'll be back when there is more progress to show. Well, I thought this port PCB thing could work. But uh, I was wrong. I thought the hole spacing here matched the hole spacing on the MGN9 rail for the Y axis, but obviously they don't. And obviously the holes on the PCB are sized for M5 screws instead of M3 screws. So yeah, that's not going to work. So I'll have to design some sort of a solution on the back extrusion for the Y limit switch. But hey, at least it means no drag chain, which is definitely a bonus but uh, more printed parts, which I have no idea how I'm going to do. Either that or you know, I'll do something janky here and hope it works, we'll see. And here is my solution for the Y limit switch. Uh, just a metal L bracket and some MGF printed parts. These parts are these um, spacers. So these are the spacers that go between the aluminum plate and the extrusion. So this part basically. I ordered double the amount I need for those, so I have plenty to spare, so yeah, I could just use those, so I added this metal L bracket just to support it, and then screwed the mouse uh, Omron switch, the limit switch, into that with soft upper screws, and then zip tied that in place here, as you can see. I also added this behind that as a spacer, because it needs it to be a bit more forward than that, which is screwed to the extrusion, and I added a little bit of super glue here, and on the other side as well, just so this piece doesn't uh, slide forward because obviously the zip tie is not a great solution. So, you know, it's not ideal, but it will work. And then after I get the printer working, I can always 
printer replacement for that so again not a big deal this should be good enough for now and I added that same L bracket on this side as well this is another thing I didn't have printed parts for and that is the drag chain mount they both should be on this drive but again I don't have the printed parts for it it's not designed for that so yeah uh, there is a screw hole here so I'll just put the drag chain on that and you know, that should be good enough so uh, yeah uh, this should work so yeah I'm still waiting for the Y rails I removed, I removed and cleaned these Y rails once again and then I also uh, dropped these carriages in the ultrasonic cleaner as well and after that after cleaning everything lubricated them as well but yeah uh, they're still not great so I'm uh, waiting for the replacement Y rails which I've as you can see I've now removed so once they're here I'll assemble the gantry and um, yeah that uh, that should be it so after that a bunch of tuning and then we can do our print and this probably our long video will uh, finally end at that point hope you're enjoying the longer video and now the gantry is assembled as you can see a few days passed since the last recording but the MGN 9 rails still aren't here so I had to install the old MGN 9 rails which as I said aren't in the world's greatest condition but it is what it is like I really can't uh, wait uh, that much longer San Antonio to Houston really shouldn't take more than one day but you know it's USPS so uh, eventually when it gets here on horseback or carrier pigeon uh, if I don't feel lazy I'll uh, swap these rails with the new rails and yeah anyway for now I think it should be good enough I uh, also did the wire management from the front motors to the back CAN bus controller here now I use these uh, Amazon bought uh, wire clips which have this uh, double-sided tape on the back it really feels like VHP or you know knockoff VHP which is probably the best kind of double-sided tape you can use for this but you know, double-sided tape is double-sided tape especially because it's in a heated chamber well heated by the bed not with a chamber heater but you know it gets uh, warm I don't think these are going to last so the idea is temporarily to use these and then when the printer is printing again print some 3d printed parts that screw into these screw holes not all of them I'll remove a few of these and replace them uh, uh, with longer screws that hold the cable clips in place uh, yeah I'll just swap them with 3d printed parts but I don't think that will be in this video so uh, yeah that's something I'll do later and hopefully these wire clip thingies last uh, long enough for me to do that and uh, yeah as i said they're connected to the pcbs on the back side which i've also joined with the canvas cable so that's also ready well it's disconnected right now but you know it, the cable is ready too i had to remove the 120 ohm resistor from this pcb because this is not at an end of the canvas uh looks like there is enough room to add a jumper there so if there is a new revision of this pcb i think that should be a nice thing to add to this pcb but as it is only thing i could do was to remove that um 120 ohm termination resistor so that's what i did so uh yeah uh, anyway this is at one end uh, this was in the middle and then this will run to the uh, canvas controller which is connected to the raspberry pi and from the raspberry pi a different cable will run to the tool head to the big 3 tech ebb sp2240 which is my canvas tool head board which uh, this cable was included with that as well so if you're wondering where that cable came from they included like three meters or something of that of canvas cable which is you know way more than you need so i've been using that as the canvas cable on a lot of my printers for example on the micron as well and uh, yeah if you want more information about the b3tech ebb sp2240 uh, i have a review video of that on the channel so you can check that out but um, yeah uh, that's how the canvas will be wired uh, as you can see I also ran the belts but you know they're pretty loose at the moment you really shouldn't tighten those before installing the gantry on the printer so that's what I'm waiting to do and I do have quite a bit of slack on that as well I think I bought five meters which is a bit more than I needed but that's fine you know I can just cut that it's not a big deal um, as I said using nine millimeter belt and I'm using the EPDM variant of the 2GT belt instead of the Know, the standard RF version so that's what the E stands for here so the next step is to flash those uh, gantry canvas PCBs the GBB 15s which I already did but that was a bit fun 
So there are two things to talk about there. One of them is those PCBs are based on STM32G0B1s, which I also use on some of my PCB projects as well, because it's a pretty good MCU overall. But one thing with the STM32G0B1s is you have to connect it to your PC and use STM32Q programmer, or you can do it through DFU util as well if you prefer. But you have to do that before flashing firmware. You have to uncheck a box, the end boot cell box, Otherwise, uh, after you flash firmware, it is essentially bricked and you won't be able to flash firmware again unless you have an SD link lying around, then you can you know, uh, use that to uncheck that box and then you can actually enter DFU mode, but that is difficult and not everyone has an SD link lying around. So that is very important to do and it is well documented on the GitHub repository of the project, which is nice to see. So uh, I did that, but doing that was also a bit fun. And that's the other thing with this PCB. Typically the 3.3 volt you use to power the MCU is generated from the 5 volts and you do it that way because uh, you can use the 5 volt from the USB to generate the 3.3 volts, you just add an LDO to regulate that. But uh, that also means that you have to add a separate regulator to regulate 5 volts from the 24 volts. So you know you need to add more components to do that. That's how I do it, but in this case I'm guessing this is to do with the compactness of this PCB because this PCB is primarily designed for ant farm printers, so you know, it has to be really compact. I'm guessing that's the reason uh, the creator of this PCB didn't do it this way, but it doesn't use the 5 volts from the USB and it generates the 3.3 volts directly from 24 volts. And the result of that is you can't just connect the USB cable and you know uncheck that end boot cell box or flash firmware etc. You need to connect it to 24 volts. Now that was a bit difficult with my setup because I don't really have a good computer to do that in the workshop. I do have a laptop there but it doesn't really work that well for this and you know I don't really have a 24 volt uh, test pan setup. It's something I want to improve in the workshop eventually but yeah what I had to do is grab 3.3 volts from a Raspberry Pi and solder that 3.3 uh, volt uh, wire to the 3.3 volt test pad that's on the SWD uh, part of the PCB and uh, that way the MCU got power and then I used the Raspberry Pi to flash it using the FU util. I typically just do it using the STM32Q programmer on a PC because I find that to be a bit easier but yeah, in this case, this was the only way I could do it. Anyway, I did that, and I also flashed CAN boot as well, so it's ready for flashing clipper. And after the recording you just saw in this video, the MGN 9 rails also arrived. It took USPS 9 days to deliver something from San Antonio to Houston, but that's USPS for you. I cleaned the rails, I lubricated them, and I mounted them on the printer, and they are mounted in the next clip in this video. I just forgot to mention that in that, so I'm mentioning it now. So. Let's move on to that. The gantry is now mounted on the printer as you can see and uh, it's going well so far. You can see that the belts are also now tightened. You can tell by the fact that they're not sagging anymore. Now these are as tight as guitar strings right now. But uh, these are 9mm belts and they are supposed to be tighter. So honestly I don't know how tight they're supposed to be. I guess we'll see as I uh, use the printer. But they're at the tightest they can be right now. You can tell by the fact that there is no gap between the tensioning plate slash block and the uh, uh, part that the motor is connected to so yeah the hopefully it doesn't need to be tighter than this but if it needs to be tighter than this then i need to loosen that all that up remove the tool head and then tighten it under the uh, where the vitali uh, plate is so yeah it's still possible to tighten it it just will be a pain in the ass so hopefully i don't need to do that there are a few things i had to remove to do the belt tightening the temporary uh, y limit switch and the drag chain mount I had to remove temporarily because I needed access to those screws but those are easy enough to mount. Now uh, you can see that the thing is turned on as well you can tell by the fact that there is an LED on that PCB which means it's getting its power too. You can't really see the LED on this PCB but the power for this PCB is daisy chained from this PCB so if this is getting power this is getting power too so yeah uh, the wiring on that uh, seems to work and the tool head PCB is also getting power. You can tell by, it, by the fact that the fan here is running. So yeah, the wiring, at least power wiring seems to be good so far, but I still have to work on the CAN bus. Uh, obviously the clip, there's a clipper error on the screen right now. I have to configure a bunch of stuff. So that's, uh, that's the thing I'm going to work on next. There are a few changes here as well. I got rid of the mellow UTOC, which was sitting on this printed part here. That was my CAN bus controller, but I'm testing a new PCB and uh, because of that I didn't need that anymore. So I have a CAN bus 
technically not a hat because it doesn't have the squared prong but hat-ish PCB on the Raspberry Pi here and uh, yeah that has the CAN bus stuff so that's something I'm testing and uh, yeah I will talk more about this PCB in a later video probably I don't think it will be ready in this video but something I'm testing and that PCB is also handling the power previously I was using this uh, 5 volt 3 amp uh, I was going to say power brick but more like a tiny cube anyway uh, I was using that to power the Raspberry Pi and the reason for that is even though the spider here uh, has a 5 volt supply for the Raspberry Pi I was constantly getting the lightning symbol on the screen here which means the Raspberry Pi was getting under voltage so yeah for whatever reason even with thicker gauge wires and all that I just couldn't make it work so I was using this uh, adapter but yeah, now I have that new PCB I'm testing, so I don't need that anymore. So that's also something I removed. Yeah, it turns out multi-MCU homing is not supported on multi-MCU shared axes. Because I have one of the X motors and one of the Y motors on uh, per GBB15 on the gantry, uh, that is a multi-MCU shared axis. Because one of the, say, X axes, uh, one of the X motors is on the one MCU on one of the GBB15s and the other X motor is on the other GBB15 connected to the other MCU. So it's a multi MCU shared axis and multi MCU homing is not supported on that apparently. Not the end of the world, I'll just wire it in a way that uh, the uh, each GBB15 controls one axis. But uh, yeah, that's not going to be ideal in terms of cable management. Well, Murphy's Law strikes again as usual. Fucking Murphy. So, uh, you might have already noticed this GBB15 is hanging in the air. I just wanted to verify that this GBB15 wasn't shortened against the extrusion and it's not. So yeah, what's going on is that GBB15 is dead. But yeah, the symptoms are uh, the Y axis, which is connected to that GBB15 or the axis that's currently defined as Y in the config. I'm not sure if it's actually the Y axis or not because uh, well, it'll be A and B anyway, so it's not actually Y, but what I mean is I don't know if that should be defined as X or Y, but whatever. What matters is what's currently defined as Y on the config is connected to that GBB15 and the X is connected to that GBB15. And if I buzz the X axis, everything is working just fine. You can, I don't know if you can see it or not, but the tool head is moving just fine. So everything is working just fine. And the other motor on the same axis works just fine as well. And again, they're both connected to connected to this GBB15. This GBB15 has both the Y motors and both Y motors have the same symptom. This, I don't know if you can see it, but you can probably hear it. Or maybe you can see this belt here. So yeah, uh, it's, it's not working. Now with a symptom like this, there are a few things you first check, like uh, belt tightness comes to mind, wiring comes to mind, run current comes to mind. I checked all of those and none of those fixed it. And as you can see, I also checked if it was shorted against the extrusion and that didn't fix it either. But uh, what made me sure that it was the GBB15 that's dead is I connected the Y motors with the same cable that's on the Y motors to this GBB15, the X GBB15 and buzzed them. And the Y axis worked just fine, just like the X axis does. And if I connect the X motors to this GBB15, the X motors don't work. And again, I'm using the wires that are connected to those motors. So uh, in this process, obviously the wires were also checked and they're obviously good as well. So yeah, uh, only explanation is this GBB15 arrived dead on arrival, which is fun. So yeah, that's something I'll have to figure out. Uh, I might contact Fabrico and see if they send me a replacement or I might just buy a new one to be honest I tend to be a bit lazy well I removed the GBB15 from there it's this one and I got a replacement GBB15 but uh, you can tell by the fact that I'm recording this fucking Murphy of course it just didn't work so yeah this is the replacement GBB15 I did lift this pad, I'll explain what happened to that in a sec, but uh, this was before all that, that pad was lifted. I mounted that on here as soon as I got the GBB15, literally today, like a few hours ago. And um, yeah, connected that to 24 volt to CAN bus cable that is, which is uh, daisy, chain, uh, daisy chain to this cam, uh, gantry PCB too. So that one was getting power just fine too, which, was, which means this was getting power too. Uh, turned on the, turned on the system the green light on the back side lit up I assumed everything was fine now the instructions tell you to connect a USB cable to uh, to do the 
uh, end boot self thing and then flash uh, can boot yeah i connected the usb cable while the system was on and the display on the raspberry pi just showed uh, just got corrupted it just wasn't showing anything and then obviously uh, i disconnected the usb cable as soon as i could and then everything went back to normal I uh, removed the new GBB15 from the extrusion, thinking maybe it's the pins on the GBB15 shorting against the extrusion, and uh, powered it on again, and then uh, connected the USB cable to it. And this time, the display didn't get corrupted, everything was looking fine, so uh, thinking it was the extrusion somehow, even though, as I explained earlier in the video, chances of that actually causing a short is uh, very slim. And, but I still don't like the design for it, which I also talked about. But anyway, chances of it actually being a problem is very slim. I went to the laptop to SSH into the Raspberry Pi here. And while I was uh, SSHing into it, actually literally as I hit enter to SSH into it, uh, the Raspberry Pi completely turned off. And uh, the lights on the backside of it were also off too. Like everything just turned off. Which is... Uh, really weird because as I talked about earlier in the video the USB 5 volt on this USB connector isn't actually connected to anything on the PCB and the ground was already connected because the ground cable at ground and 24 volt were powered by that cable there which the other PCB worked just fine off of so obviously the connection there is fine and the grounds are all tied together yeah, especially because the 25 uh, volt Ford Raspberry Pi is uh, actually coming from the same 24 volt supply, so now they are obviously tied together. So, so uh, connecting the USB cable, all it does is it connects the data cable, uh, data pins. So, yeah, uh, I don't know what happened to be honest. So, I removed it completely from the system. Uh, got a sacrificial Raspberry Pi. I have a few of those. Wired 3.3 volt and ground into this. Uh, from an external supply, that external supply being an ST-Link, but I didn't use the SWD first, I just uh, powered it with 3.3 volt from that and connected the USB cable. And, um, oh, actually, before that, I connected the 3.3 volt and the ground to the Raspberry Pi's GPIO, but uh, I don't think the power, uh, the 3.3 volt regulator on the Raspberry Pi was powerful enough for this. Either that or there's a short one here, which is another possibility, but the LED here, it was... Uh, like it wasn't at a constant brightness, the brightness kept changing, indicating the voltage that kept changing. So instead I wired it to the 3.3 volt supply from an ST-Link and this time the LED was constantly on. It was constantly on when I powered it from 24 volts too, by the way. It wasn't like that when I was powering it from 24 volts. Anyway, uh, I connected this uh, with a USB cable to the Raspberry Pi and the device wasn't recognized in DFU mode. Now, there is a possibility of that happening, as I talked about earlier in the video, the STM32G0B1s uh, need you to uncheck a box in STM32Q programmer or using DFU util, the end boot cell option, otherwise, after entering DFU mode and you flashing firmware to it, it won't enter DFU mode again unless you check that box. Uh, well, there is a way to do it, but uh, it needs to be done in software, that's the idea. So, if that happens, the way to fix that is to... Uh, use uh, an ST link to uh, into this and then yeah ST link can uh, fix that I've saved a few PCBs that way so I wired the ST link to the SWD pads here and um, yeah I uh, wired the reset to the ST link as well because I hate timing this button when using ST link ST link does have a way of uh, uh, triggering a hard reset essentially just wire the uh, pin that goes to the reset button to the ST link it just works it just presses the button for you essentially so I wired all that it refused to uh, communicate with it saying something about uh, corrupted or bad flash so yeah uh, it just uh, didn't work with ST link either so yeah I'm done with it so uh, after all that because I really needed the printer printing ASAP I uh, had to wire the two motors that were connected to that bad GBB15 to the Fizek uh, Spider here, my main controller for this printer. And uh, yeah, those wires are just routed out of two panels like this. And there is a little bit of uh, you know, a small piece of the 9mm belt in here as well. And that's there to um, protect the wire because, you know, these ACM panels have aluminum. Aluminum? What the hell is aluminum? Uh, aluminum. So because these ACM panels have aluminium, if it pierces into the wire, 
uh, that's going to be pretty bad. So, yeah, uh, obviously need to protect wires, which is what I did. I also installed this uh, Big Tree Tech smart filament switch, but it's not actually installed. Like the cable is actually connected to the Fizex spider there, but I didn't do any of the config for that. It's mounted here because I needed an extension on the Bowden, and this is a, acts as a glorified Bowden coupling. So, yeah, it, it's connected to the spool up here, but. Yeah, um, the printer is mostly working now, finally, so I can, for example, home and uh, it should uh, home just fine, so I guess that is good news and I did print with this printer too and uh, it prints-ish, realize there's a wire in front of the limit switch, so well, it managed to home anyway. So anyway, yeah, I managed to print with this printer and it printed okay-ish a few times actually. So uh, yeah, it uh, managed to do that just fine. And you know, as you can see, it homes just fine too. And I am actually heating the bed to 85 degrees Celsius right now, getting ready for another print. There are some issues. Uh, first of all, the motors uh, need to be synced. I tried doing that, but I really didn't have much time to uh, deal with that, so they're not properly synced yet, so that is one issue. Another issue I have is with the probe. Uh, it's not accurate enough. Uh, it's the it's uh, Vitaly tap. I'm sure it's fine, because even Voron tap is fine, so I'm sure the Vitaly tap is fine as well. I just need to like tune some things, maybe tighten some bolts somewhere, I don't know, I just need to spend some time with it, I guess, but right now it's not terribly accurate. But uh, anyway, what happened to that GBB-15? I uh, don't know what was wrong with the first GBB-15, like I know the symptom, as I showed that in video even, but I don't know the root cause. The second one though was relatively easy to figure out once I uh, actually inspected the PCB. There was a little uh, solder ball or more likely just that dried solder paste really what it felt like uh, stuck between a leg of the electrolytic capacitor and uh, one of the poles of a multi-layer ceramic capacitor on the back side and then that's an and you know that's an electrolytic capacitor that's obviously 24 volts i don't know what the mlcc was for but you know you can guess what happens if you dump 24 volts into where it's not supposed to be so um you know, to be honest, I guess I got somewhat lucky with that, if you can call it that, because, you know, again, everything else is working, including the Raspberry Pi, but... Yeah, uh, that ex definitely explains it. So, uh, yeah, that GBB-15 is gone, and, um, yeah, I, I got a refund on that as well. One thing with the Voron vendors is, uh, you know, shit happens. Shit happened multiple times in a row in this case. Uh, it's just my luck, I guess. Every fucking thing went wrong with this printer mode as you saw in this video and there are even more things that went wrong like a uh, corrupted SD card and uh, yeah anyway uh, yeah there was a delay with another part as well anyway uh, yeah one thing with the Voron vendors is yeah shit can go wrong but uh, they'll take care of you and in this case after the second one also didn't work I got a refund so yeah I'm sure the GB15s are fine as I said the, this one is for example working just fine I just got unlucky multiple times in a row with the GBB-15. Yeah, uh, obviously this temporary solution of having wires hanging on the sides of the printer, exiting the panels like this, and then connected to the uh, Fizek Octopus. That's, uh, Fiz not Fizek Octopus, Fizek Spider Octopus is a big three tech. Anyway, uh, that's obviously not a uh, elegant solution and that's definitely not permanent. So I need to come up with a different electronic solution for this printer. So the requirements to meet are uh, narrower than 20 millimeters wide, which is the width of the extrusion because I'm mount to mount it on the extrusion. So narrower than that, CAN bus and obviously stepper drivers, preferably four, but as far as I know, there aren't any PCBs out there that actually have four drivers and meet the 20 millimeter width uh, requirements. So at least two, that way I can get two PCBs, but preferably four. Now I'm only aware of two PCBs that meet this requirement, the party in the back PCB and the GBB-15, which is what I ended up going with. So starting with the GBB-15, it's an STM32G0B1 based uh, PCB, that's its MCU, has CAN bus and has two TMC2209 drivers, which is probably the most popular uh, stepper driver out there and yeah, for a good reason, it's a pretty good stepper driver. 
and uh, it's 15 millimeters wide. The reason for that is it's designed for 1515 extrusions like printers for ants, uh, 3D printers, or Volon Zero. So uh, yeah, it's a gantry board for those printers. So yeah, as you know, I got two of these. One of those is working just fine. It's currently mounted on the printer and the printer is currently printing without issues. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fine PCB, but I did get unlucky two times in a row with the other one. So, you know, again, the one I have is working just fine. I'm sure this is a fine design. So, you know, don't take this to mean that, you know, it's a PCB to avoid, but uh, when you get bad PCBs in a row, you tend to not feel like uh, buying another one, I guess. So, yeah, as much as I like the design of this, uh, it, it is a pretty cool PCB. I don't think I'm going to go with this. But uh, before discovering the GBB15, I was aware of this uh, party in the back PCB for actually quite some time now. It's a 20mm wide PCB with an RP2040 MCU and, yeah, obviously, CAN bus as well. It has two uh, different non standard, uh, or maybe it's some different standard, but not the standard standard uh, step six slots, which house uh, TMC5160 drivers. And uh, the reason for those non standard or different standard, whatever it is, uh, step six is because apparently these 5160 step six are better than standard 5160 step six. But uh, yeah, the point of TMC 5160s is they're, they support 48 volts. So uh, yeah, I mean, they're pretty cool. I just uh, you know don't see the point of using these because I don't intend to upgrade to 48 volts. They will work with 24 volts, but you know, at that point might as well use TMC 2209s. They'll uh, work more or less the same. Um, some people might argue that 5160s might still have a slight edge over uh, 2209s, even at 24 volts, but uh, I doubt the difference would be uh, worth it. So you can see the price here. It's 90 bucks for this PCB, and I'd need two of these. So that's 180 bucks plus tax and shipping, uh, you know, over 200 bucks. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't see this being worth it, especially because, as I said, I don't intend to use 48 volts. Not buying this also comes with another benefit of not giving Fizek any money. I tend to vote with my wallet with these kind of things. For example, I've never bought anything from Slice Engineering, and uh, ever since uh, Fizek did what they did, which I don't want to get into, I've been doing my best to avoid buying stuff from them and so far I haven't bought a single thing from them and I do intend to keep it that way. I do have a Fizek spider on my printer that was before they did what they did and that was also provided as a free review sample but you know I wouldn't have accepted that uh, after the thing they did though they never asked since then anyway but yeah the answer would be no if they did. Anyway uh, yeah uh, you know this will work I just uh, I just don't want to buy this for the reasons I've listed. So, another alternative is this Big Tree Tech MMB uh, PCB for Enraged Bit Project Carrot Feeders. Now, uh, even though it says it's for Enraged Bit Carrot Feeders, you can see this has four uh, stepper slots. So, yeah, I don't know why they decided to design a PCB for Enraged Bit Carrot Feeder with four stepper drivers, but yeah, they did. So, this has four of those has CAN bus, has some uh, STM MCU, so, you know, it does sound perfect in that way, but obviously, as you can see here, it is not 20 millimeters wide. It would be possible to mount this on the gantry, uh, only thing is, I'd have to mount this vertically with a 3D printed part, which I guess isn't the end of the world, but it definitely wouldn't be the most elegant solution, that's for sure, so... Yeah, I'd prefer to avoid this. Another potential problem with mounting this vertically is the foam insulation I have in my chamber. Uh, if the gantry gets tilted, which you know it does when I uh, the Z motors are de-energized, the back motors tend to fall down a bit, and then the Z goes up, it might actually get stuck on that foam, which would also not be fun. It will work. This is something I am considering, but uh, it is not ideal. I'd much prefer to have a 20 millimeter wide PCB with four steppers. But uh, if you are aware of any other option that might work for me, especially if they're 20 millimeters wide, do leave them in the comments down below and I will definitely consider it. There is actually another PCB that I might end up going with. 
and that is something uh, I was considering using before I discovered the GBB15. I was aware of the part in the back PCB, but I didn't want to use it for the reasons I've listed. Uh, GBB15 though, I decided it would work just fine and yeah, again, I got unlucky I guess, but yeah, what I'm talking about is my own custom PCB. So this is uh, obviously a very early layout, but uh, I started working on this before discovering GBB15, thought that there wasn't anything out there that I could use, so I used an STM32G0B1 MCU here, which is coincidentally the same MCU the GBB15 uses, though I used a slightly different variant. And uh, I do use this MCU in a lot of my other projects as well, for example, the Nevermore controller. And uh, yeah, obviously has CAN bus with a TI transceiver here. And four TMC2240 drivers. You can only see three right now, but yeah, obviously this is a very early layout. In fact, I actually did start uh, working on a newer version of this after I had the problems with the GBB15. This time, double-sided load. And uh, yeah, there are a few improvements here that I don't want to really get into but this is my process i tend to depending on the complexity of the pcb project i tend to do from a handful of layouts to you know, sometimes 10 15 layouts and this would certainly be near that end especially because this is probably the most complicated pcb i've designed to date and well i haven't really designed it because it's not done yet but if I do finish it, then it would be, I guess, is what I'm saying. So before the next video, I have to decide if I want to finish this PCB or not. And if I do decide to finish it, then obviously finish it. Or if I decide I don't want to finish this PCB and just use something off the shelf. If I decide to go with something off the shelf, then I need to decide what that is. And right now, uh, the main candidate is that big 3Tech PCB that I showed, even though it's not 20 millimeters wide, though... Definitely let me know if there is a 20mm wide PCB out there with CAN bus, with uh, preferably four, but at least two separate drivers. Uh, definitely let me know because, uh, yeah, I might just end up going with that. I'd prefer to not design my own uh, PCB with blackjack and hookers and just use something off the shelf. So, I don't know. If I do use something off the shelf, uh, leading candidate right now is that big 3 tech PCB. Uh, the GBB15 might be okay too. I just... Uh, as as I said, I had a, a multiple bad PCBs in a row, so I, I don't feel like uh, risking it, I guess. But, I mean, the third time, it probably is the charm. It probably isn't that bad, but... Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't feel like risking it anyway, so... Probably not that, and uh, almost certainly not the party in the back PCB. So, yeah, uh, I'll have to decide what I want before the next video. And again, if you have any opinions on that, leave them in the comments down below. So in the next Warhound 2 video, we will actually get the electronics finished on the gantry first and then move on to the Enrage Rabbit Project Carrot Feeder. So the first few minutes, or if I ramble for long enough, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or 5 hours, who knows, uh, of the next video will be the electronics for the 9mm all-wheel drive gantry. And after that, we will move on to the Enrage Rabbit Project for the main uh, content of that video. So yeah, definitely stay tuned for that. Another video to stay tuned for, which will be the next video on the channel, is a new custom PCB project I've been working on. It's actually mounted on the Warhound 2 uh, right now. It's powering the Raspberry Pi, it has CAN bus, and it has a bunch of other features that are, uh, I think, pretty cool. So, yeah, uh, I've been working on that PCB for some time now, I think since December, if I remember correctly. But uh, I think uh, sometime next month that PCB will be released and I will make a video about that. So that will probably be the next video on the channel and uh, yeah, definitely stay tuned for that too. But uh, yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like down below and thanks for watching.